Thank you so much, uh, Brother Zadok and uh, the Gospel Sounders team. And uh, we praise the Lord for an opportunity to be able to interact uh, in the word of God and uh, see what the Lord is speaking to us. And uh, the power that uh, he wants to provide to all of us so that uh, we may be his representatives in this fallen world and uh, we may be his witnesses in these times that we are living in. And so I'd like to welcome everyone uh, in the four corners of the world and who will come uh, to be in position with this material that uh, may the light of God shine upon our hearts and um, we may embrace the truth uh, because error does not sanctify, but the truth sanctifies. And so i like us to be able to pray and then um, we look into our third presentation on um, the last generation. Today we are looking at uh, the experience of Job. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, once again, we are in your presence, Lord, in, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. We pray that uh, that joy may fill our hearts, that uh, no report may, Lord, bring sadness in our hearts, but we may rejoice because Christ is in the most holy place pleading for us. And so help us to accept the atonement that is going on in heaven, and we may be aligned on Christ's side that we may not cherish our own ideas, but uh, we may cherish that which we hear the Spirit speak to our hearts. And as it has been written to the seven churches, let him who has ear hear what the Spirit speaketh unto the churches. Lord, we want to be part of those little flock who shall be able to hear you speak to your sheep, to your lamb, and to your people in this time that you are living in. And so accord us your presence. May you work uh, uh, for me and through me this feeble instrument and uh, that I may proclaim your word in clearness Lord that uh, your children may be benefited and so we are using feeble instruments may you hold up the network and the weather so that uh, it may be possible that uh, we shall be able to share your word in gladness in Jesus name I pray amen And so again, uh, I have just to say I'm glad for being given an opportunity to be able to present the, the issue of uh, the last generation. It is uh, something that uh, we have to study. As it were, we are just touching some uh, foundational things and uh, covering some ground, but uh, it is left to the searcher of the truth to go and uh, review everything and see if these things be so and test every spirit and reject that which is not truth and accept that which is truth. At the end of the day, we want to have a character of Jesus Christ, a character that is grounded upon that said the Lord, not what that said the man. And so in this final generation, we shall be having a people who shall stand with their Bibles and explain the hope they have and the faith that uh, they are, um, are exercising or believing in. Uh, we are told that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, that sanctify the Lord in your heart, that you may be able to give a reason of the hope you have and the faith you have in Christ, so that those who speak evil of you may be ashamed when they speak of you. We don't want to be found uh, not being, uh, not able to explain that uh, what we believe. We want to be able to explain that what we believe. And so the experience of Job, um, the, we looked at uh, the synopsis and um, uh, we have looked at uh, the last generation. And today we are in the experience of Job, uh, the experience of Job, something that is so much important because uh, Inspiration tells us that the experience that Job had will be an experience of the last generation. We understand that uh, although Christ was able to defeat Satan on Calvary, Satan was not destroyed completely. In fact, when you read Daniel chapter 7, verse 12, we see that um, 
uh, the life of uh, the first three beasts of Daniel chapter seven was prolonged in the fourth beast, which is the little horn, both embracing pagan Rome and then papal Rome. But then at the end of the day, or at the end of the time when we are living in the last uh, days, we see that we come in compact with uh, the little horn, the face of the papal Rome. And that papal Rome, when re you read um, Revelation chapter 13, we are told that the dragon gave her the seat or him the seat and the power. And so we are not just contending, contending with the little horn, but we are actually contending with the devil himself uh, uh, in the form of papal Rome. And this is not to condemn individuals, but uh, the system in which these things shall be done through. And so if uh, the devil is going through to work a system, God has also a system that he has to work with. If the devil is going to work with a church, so God is going to have his church. And the devil was not destroyed so that a demonstration may be made. And so by his act of rebellion, he had declared God's government at fault. And even when you read the great controversy, the history, uh, we are told that um, uh, he wanted to make um, heaven something. He wanted to improve the government of God. But then, you know, when God had created everything, we are told that everything was perfect. You cannot improve on the plan of God as a, a created uh, being or a creature. Uh, you cannot improve on the plan of God as a creature. And so his claims uh, uh, of improving the, the government of God, what it ended up is not the rising of Satan or the rising of man, but uh, the falling of, uh, of Lucifer and becoming Satan, and then we had the falling of man. Uh, and so anytime a creature tries to um, uh, modify uh, what God has given in his perfection, actually you don't find that this, that this arising of uh, something, but that is a fall of something. And so God could ill afford not to give Satan an opportunity to demonstrate his theories. And why should he give him an opportunity to demonstrate his theories so that um, uh, every doubt may be removed from everyone that will choose either side that they will be choosing. And so uh, talking about the experience of Job, which we shall be coming unto, uh, it, it, it is as if God himself were on trial because uh, Satan uses his uh, forces, his churches, and his systems, and God is using his forces, and he's using his system and his churches. And so what are the things that are, are happening as we speak right now? In the book of um, Deuteronomy chapter 19, I like to go to the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 19. And just uh, uh, highlight some of the things that um, are happening there. The book of uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 19. This is uh, some chapter that we are used to, but uh, I like to read it again 19, 15 to 21. The book of uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 19, verse 15. We are told one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him, that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priest and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shall thou put the evil away from among you, and those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit to more 
any shall commit no more any such a evil among you. And then I shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot for foot. And so verse 19 says that a demonstration has to be there that uh, those who shall remain uh, shall henceforth commit no more any such a evil. And so what is going on is God is on trial and he is on trial in his people that really can God produce a people who can align with his government and not rebel against him with their own free choice, not being uh, drafted in the government as puppets, but being given an enough period to choose which side they will be on. And so Deuteronomy chapter 19 gives us a scenario where two people are in conflict and witnesses have to be produced so that they may be able to decide the case that is at hand. And so the judges in those days shall be able to decide which side is right and which side is wrong. Now, when the rebellion happened in heaven, what we heard is that Lucifer, who was a, a created being, um, wanted to take the position of the son of God. And so God could not be a witness for his own son. But then the angels were there to witness what was happening and to decide the case. But also the angels could not really understand the issues at stake more uh, uh, vividly until Satan was allowed to demonstrate what his government was made of. And so when his place was not found in heaven, actually he was brought here on earth so that he may demonstrate what he would like his government to look like. And then uh, that is, I said in 6,000 years ago, the father and the son came to a conclusion that the government of Satan is not okay. And then uh, 2,000 years ago, AD 31, the angels decided that no, this person's government is not okay. But then we had the human beings who had to see the demonstration of the evil one. And in the near future, they also have to decide if they want to be on the side of the government of Saturn or on the government of, um, uh, of God. And so God has again to send Saturn or to inquire of him if he is seeing a certain people on the face of the earth as he sent him or as he inquired of him if he was able to see Job on this face of the earth. And so uh, this demonstration has been permitted to continue until now, but soon it's going to come to an end. And what a demonstration it has been uh, from the time of Cain uh, who killed his brother Abel, hatred and bloodshed, cruelty and oppression has followed in the footsteps of Satan and everyone has to come to a decision that uh, on which side is he going to be on? And so, the just man has been made a prey. God's messengers have been tortured and killed and God's law has been trampled in the dust. And what is Satan saying? That he has a government that um, uh, uh, is more better than the government of God. And so while he continues to demonstrate this, we are caught up in the middle that the same allegation that he had in heaven that he wants to improve the government of heaven and the lifestyle of the angels, again, he has come here on earth and is trying to pull men into his government to demonstrate that uh, his government is the government that is better than the government of God. And so even then, God did not destroy Satan in heaven and also on Calvary, Calvary he did not destroy him. The demonstration has to be completed. Only when the last events are taking place and men are on the point of exterminating one another, then God will have a company that will refuse to be involved in the deception of the evil one. Not by coercion, but by the love they see that God has demonstrated not only towards them, but also towards Satan himself. Remember, even during the flood, we find that God, who is a loving God, actually demonstrated his character. He had a chance to finish up the devil himself. 
but uh, um, amidst the, the, the elements of earth that were roaring and the flood and the water, Satan and his angels were kept still alive because uh, God is not a God of force. He would like things to play out the way that they have to play out. And so the demonstration shows that high position is not satisfactory to ambitious individual. Satan has been trying to get on top of things, but God says that that is not how my government works. And um, uh, we can be sure that God is also testing us as he allows the devil to do what he's doing. Also, he is testing us. In the book of Jude chapter 1, or Jude 1, 6, uh, I'll just go there. Jude 1, 6. This is what we read. Jude 1, 6. We are told, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. But uh, what does this have to do with the final generation? God has called us in this world to occupy certain positions as we live on the face of the earth. And the final generation shall be satisfied with whatever Lord that the God, the Lord of, uh, the God of heaven has given unto them. They shall not be like the apostate um, angel who was not satisfied with the position he had been given but um, when worrying after a position that he had not been given. And then you find in the book of Genesis chapter three, also Eve not being satisfied with the position she was given, she erred and went away from the husband and found herself in temptation. And there being in sin also tempted the husband and they fell all into sin. And everything has to be restored in the end time we are talking about aligning ourselves with the government of God and being satisfied in the positions that he, have been give, he has given unto us. In the previous generation, we have seen uh, people have not been aligned completely with the government of God. We saw Israel going into apostasy because they will not maintain the order that the Lord had given unto them. We have seen the churches also uh, are going astray and doing the things that even the Bible itself condemns, things that are clear in the Bible are actually uh, put a darkness on it or uh, are cast into a shadow of doubt. We see churches having their own gospel order and organization, which is not unto the Lord. And God is seeking a people who shall be able to restore all things. In fact, talking about this last generation in the book of Malachi, the book of Malachi chapter three and then Malachi chapter four, Malachi. This generation has to restore everything unto the Lord. We are told in uh, Malachi chapter three and um, verse 14, we have said it is vain to serve God and what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. And now we call the crowd happy. Yeah, they that work wickedness are set up. Yeah, they that tempt God are even delivered. People love to position themselves where God has not placed them. And then they are happy with that. They are proud of that. And wickedness is, is as if it is permeating the whole Christendom. God is going to have a people who will mourn over these things and then reestablish or realign themselves with the true order of heaven. And so he says, then that they that feared the Lord spake, up, spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and had it, and a book of remembrance was written uh, before him for them that feared the Lord, and that they that thought upon his name. When you go to Malachi chapter 4, we are told that um, verse 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And God is going to have a generation which shall go in the spirit of Elijah and restore true worship in Israel. 
every false doctrine, every false or deceptive kind of character shall not be found amongst them. Because in Revelation chapter 14, speaking about this last generation, it says that uh, 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 they did not actually commit fornication with, uh, they did not defile themselves with women. There was no guide in their mouth, which means that um, they'll come out of these errors that are permeating Christendom and they stand apart and listen to the voice of God and not only listen to the voice of God, but will be able through his power to do that which God is calling the churches to do. And uh, in the uh, book of um, uh, First John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, this is what we find um, the book of um, First John. First John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. First John. Uh, Allow me to go there, First John chapter 2, verses 15. We read that, um, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not the fa of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, now look at this verse 18. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that, the Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is in the last time. And then he says in verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And so right there, you see that um, there will be a people maintaining the truth about God, and the truth about his government, but others who doesn't have this light will go away. And so in the final time, in the last time, John is saying that there shall be that separation. God will have his church, which will reflect his government rather than uh, uh, um, the, um, the other group, which will be reflecting the image of the beast or the government of uh, Satan. And uh, this demonstration, uh, uh, we are told in this respect, there shall be a contrast between Christ and Satan. There shall be a marked contrast between those who follow God and those who follow Satan. Satan wanted to be God. He wanted it so much that he was willing to do anything to attain his God. Christ, on the other hand, did not consider it a thing to be grasped to be like God. And so we find that in Philippians, chapter 2, he condescended and became human being, and for what reason? To show us an example of um, what uh, we are supposed to be. And so amongst the people who are waiting for the Lord, in the end time, there shall be a humility that has never been seen ever before, and there shall be a character that shall really replicate the character of Christ as has been uh, as has never been uh, before. In heaven, Lucifer had been one of the covering cherubs, and we are told that uh, in Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight, verse fourteen, that he summed up what we may call the perfection. That um, he walked in the sanctuary of the Lord. He was a covering cherub, and. Um, uh, uh, he was the guardian of the law as it were. Now think about that for a moment because uh, I want to bring out a point that will resonate with us. Satan in heaven, he walked in the presence of the Lord. He was actually a covering cherub and he sealed up the sum of perfection. But he left this position because he will not continue embracing the government of God. But this is the thought that I want to bring about uh, the final generation. That uh, the final generation will consist of the first fruits who shall stand in the presence of God. Not actually the position that Lucifer had or Satan had, because that position is uh, of the covering cherubs. But they will be ministers in the sanctuary with those cherubims 
And as we read in Revelation chapter seven, they shall not go out of the temple, which means something that um, also they will be uh, covered with that glorious light that Lucifer once had. They will be actually doers of the law of God because Satan, uh, Lucifer was uh, a covering cherub and he used to cover the ark which had the 10 commandments. And the last generation, then they have, if they will be in that position or near that position, then they have to keep the law and the commandments of God perfectly. By the grace of God, you know, Lucifer, when he was in the presence of God, he used to reflect perfectly the glory of God to the other angels that were in heaven. In fact, he was a light bearer to the other angels that were in heaven. And so the last generation, they shall shine as the firmaments of heaven and they will be in that positions of the covering cherubims. They will be next to them and they will be also light bearers, which means that they shall be shining by the glory of the father. They shall have uh, that special honor of being in the very presence of the father and serving in his temple as it is in uh, uh, they, shall, they will build pillars in the temple of God and they shall serve God in his temple. Revelation chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 7. And they shall not go out. They seal up the sum of perfection because they will repopulate the place not only where actually uh, 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 um, Lucifer used to be, but other places where the heavenly angels live. These thoughts are found in the... Uh, in, in, in the book, Truth About Angels, page 48 to 49. Uh, I'll try and go there, uh, Truth About Angels, uh, so that we may see how beautiful this Truth About Angels. Uh, TM, page 48 to 49. This is what we are told. God created man for his own glory that after test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family. The vacancies made in heaven by the fall of Satan and his angels will be filled by the redeemed of the Lord. Now, I, I would want us to catch this. And uh, I, I don't want this to sound as heresy. Uh, I get it clearly that... Um, the position that uh, Lucifer was in before he became Satan has been occupied by Gabriel, that we know. But then we have this thought, and it can be really gotten from the Bible, and then from um, uh, the spirit of prophecy that uh, there shall be a special people in heaven, the last generation, who shall be next to the four covering cherubims. And they shall be reflecting splendidly the glory of God, unlike those who shall be outside the city. This, this does not mean actually that uh, there shall be competition in heaven, because even now we understand that in heaven we have angels who are more brighter than the other angels, and there's no commotion in heaven and complaints there. And also we find that um, in heaven not all people shall have the same stars. People shall have different diadems or different stars, and uh, there shall be no problem. But um, we have to see the beauty and the honor that is conferred upon the first fruits, the 144 or the last generation. On this issue of the first fruits or the last generation or the 144,000, um, the, 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 the thought of the first fruits was the best of the harvest, which was waved before the Lord, before uh, 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 everything could be harvested and brought in the house, the farmers in Israel were, um, were expected, were told to go and bring the choicest of those which had matured first into the house of the Lord so that they may be waved before the Lord and be taken by the priest in the sanctuary. And so we find that the last generation, the 144,000, those who shall live under the comfort of the image and the mark of the beast are a special people before the Lord. And they are the first fruits, the choices of the harvest that shall be there of all the beams in the earth. And 
if this is the position that the Lord will want us to occupy, we who are living as the last generation, what kind of life should we be having upon the face of the earth? It should be a life that is exemplary, a life that is none like uh, the other that has been there in the past. And so as Lucifer summed up, uh, uh, sealed up the sum of perfection. So God is going to have a people in the last generation who shall be next to the four covering cherubims who shall seal up the sum of perfection. And so uh, Satan has been active in uh, his demonstration of what his government can look like. And so God is expecting through his grace and power to have a people who are active to demonstrate what kind of government, uh, what kind of government his government is. And when Christ died on the cross, he demonstrated his life, the possibility of keeping the law and not only keeping the letter of the law, but keeping the spirit of the law. And when we talk about the last generation not only having the letter of the law but the spirit of the law you can check out the book of matthew chapter 5 and we can as time allows go there the book of matthew chapter 5 that the last generation shall not be just having the letter of the law but shall be having the spirit of the law in the book of uh, matthew chapter 5 sorry Matthew chapter 5. There are things that Christ talks about that uh, should resonate with us. Uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 5, we are told, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And so he says that thing not I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill it. And it shall be fulfilled also in his people because Christ, uh, we are told, he, may, he was made sin. And for what purpose? That we may possess his righteousness. And so if Christ lived to fulfill the law of God perfectly and he demonstrated it when he was on the earth, we can expect that those who shall live in the presence of the uh, Father in the most holy place shall also live to fulfill the law of God. And then uh, we are told that um, um, verse 20, for I say unto you, talking about the spirit of the law, more than just the letter of the law. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribe and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the Pharisees in the day, they had the letter of the law, but they miss the righteousness, which is the spirit of the law. And God is telling this generation that uh, they may have a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, that they, they shall not just have the letter of the law, but they have, shall have the spirit of the law. And what is the spirit of the law? Look at what he says. Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shall not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger or the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the counsel, but whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. And so uh, we see the spirit of the law being demonstrated more than the letter of the law. And he goes ahead and says that um, ye have heard, verse 27, that it was said by them of the old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. And he is talking about the old covenant and the people who lived in the time of the letter of the law until the cross. And even after the cross, there are people who have lived in the letter of the law. And they say, you have heard that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in her heart. So as Christ did not sin, 
by act or by thought. The last generation is also expected not to sin either by act or by thought. Meaning that um, the word of God shall dwell in them richly. Everything that can be revealed unto them that is sin shall be revealed so that their mind may be purified their mind may come to a position that they have the father's name in their forehead as it were in revelation chapter 14 verse 1 which means that they are sin in their forehead in that they cannot commit sin by act or they cannot sin by a thought that is how the father's name is put in their forehead as the last generation the 144 but somebody may say oh this is something so hard to fathom or to think about. No, with human beings, we are told it is impossible, but with God of heaven, it is not impossible. It is possible with God. If only we can come to a point that uh, we tell the Father, in our strength, we cannot do it, but in your strength, we can be able to do it. Christ himself in the book of John chapter 15, he tells his disciples this, John chapter 15, he tells them that uh, verse three, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And so God, by speaking his word unto our hearts, unto our minds by his son, we are cleansed. And then the psalmist says in uh, Psalms 119, the division verse 11, your word have I kept in my heart that I may not sin against thee. We are talking about the totality of the word as it is in the most holy place because in various generations there have been a truth which has been revealed unto them. But uh, when we reach in the most holy place, the totality of the word of God shall be revealed unto that generation that um, there shall be nothing that Satan could point at them that um, they are his people. They shall come to a time that uh, Satan will have no charge against him, uh, against these people that they are his. And so when Christ died on the cross, he demonstrated that the law uh, is possible to be kept not only in its, it is strictest sense as the letter of the law, but the law as even as a spiritual law. And so um, on the cross, Christ was founded. And uh, we have to see in the end time that uh, also uh, uh, the believers, the last generation shall be founded and everything that can be thrown at them shall be thrown at them. The demonstration which God intends then to make with the last generation on earth means much both to the people and to God. Can God's law be really kept? Can they persevere? That is the vital question that has to be asked. Can they have the patience? And God already answers the question. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the law of God or the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Many deny that it can be done. Others, uh, um, actually, others uh, gallibly say it can. And when you look at their life, they profess godliness without the power they are in. When the whole question of commandment keeping is considered, the problem assumes large proportions. Uh, God's law is exceeding broad. And if the law of God is exceeding broad, how can a man who is limited in his understanding be able to keep this law that is so broad? But the answer is that God will give us a capability that the insinuations and the questions of Satan shall be answered. The law of God judges the motives, the thoughts, as well as the words. Commandment keeping means entire surrender to God. And uh, are we saying that God has to think for us? No, what we are saying that God has to direct our thoughts, not as puppets, but to reveal unto his perfect, as his perfect will so that uh, we may be able to decide. In the previous generation, the permissive will of God has been accepted. And uh, talking about this permissive will of God, by the way, 
there have been a lot of debates on uh, uh, the sanctuary being cleansed, the, diet, the, the, the dietary laws and uh, uh, the health laws and how can we appear before the presence of God. But brethren, we are not living in the days of the permissive will of God. We are living in the days of the perfect will of God. No one can excuse herself or himself that they do not know what the Lord requires of them when they enter in the most holy place. You look in the most holy place and uh, we have heard these excuses that, uh, oh, don't judge me what I shall eat. Don't judge me what I shall dress. No, God has put a certain diet in the most holy place not to please the fancy. God has dressed the high priest the way he is dressed, not so that uh, he, 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 he may just uh, be there as um, uh, uh, something that is so beautiful and all that. There are symbolism in these things that we have to understand that there are times that the permissive of will of God was allowed. And that is in the camp, in the courtyard, and in the holy place. But in the most holy place, God wants his perfect will to be done in his children. And Paul says in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, that let us leave these principles of the calm, the courtyard, and the holy place, and go unto perfection. And if God is willing, we shall do that. And this is the generation that is looked upon to be able to enter into the perfect will of God and not the permissive will of God. Yet, will God reproduce such a people who can be able to perfect his will or walk in his perfect will? The only prayer we can have reverently that God's, God must meet certain challenge through us and in us and for us and with us. It is not God's plan or a part of his purpose to subject men to tests that are not conceivable. And God will never allow any temptation to come to us that has not been to man. He will allow, but with that temptation, he will provide a way out. When God commands men to keep his law perfectly, it does not serve the purpose he has in mind to have only a few men to keep it. And so, as we bring this to a close in the last uh, 15 minutes, we are talking about the experience of Job. How was Job tested and how does this actually resonate with us? Job was a good man and an only man in his day. In fact, we are told in Job 1.1 that there is a man in the land of Uz who eschewed evil and was righteous or perfect in the eyes of the Lord. And so Satan has been with this charge that God cannot have so many people. Job's test, actually he passed, but God will never have many people who can replicate Job. But God, we can trust God that actually he shall accomplish this. Day by day, Job was um, uh, offering sacrifices for his son. And saying, it may be that my sons had sinned and cursed the name of the Lord. But why was Job doing this? Not because he could um, argue that he was the only holy man in the land, but he wanted his sons to join in the holiness that, and in the relationship that he had with God himself. And so in the last days, it is only not Christ who has stood the temptations and Calvary and overcome. But God is going to prove that the way Job was able to do that and the way his son was able to do that, that this is not just an exceptional uh, 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 case, but he will have a people on earth, not one, not two, but a whole generation that can be able to stand as even Job stood the trial. And so, Job in his day stood for 144, but it was in prolepsis of what will happen in the end time. Everything that Job had was taken away. And we see that in the end time, that every earthly uh, support will be cut off as everything was cut, up, cut off from Job. Not only will be monetary 
and basic needs taken away from, but everything that can be taken away so as to try the people of God and have this generation reproducing the character of God shall be taken away. When this happened, actually Job rose and rend his mandal. We find that in Job chapter 1, verses 20 and 22, and say, naked I came in this earth and naked I live. And so we shall have a people on the earth that uh, shall be able to stand with Job and more even than Job because uh, 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 God, the, the last day events shall be more than what actually Job went through. Can you imagine what Job went through? But we are told the ordeal that waits the sons of God shall be more than this. Yet Satan was defeated by Job. Uh, uh, God through Job was able to defeat Satan. And so he is waiting for us. But I want to leave you with this thought as we end. That um, all that evil one can do, Satan did to Job. But Job stood fast. His wife counseled him to give up, but he did not waver in his faith. Under intense physical pain and mental anguish, he remained steadfast. Again, it is recorded that Job stood the test. In all this, Job did not Job sin with his lips, Job chapter 2, verse 10. Satan is defeated at that particular point, and he will de be defeated forever. So in the succeeding chapters in the book of Job, we are given a little insight into the struggle again going on in Job's mind. He is greatly perplexed with what is happening. Why has all this calamity come upon me? He is not conscious of any sin that he has done against God. Remember that. He is totally ignorant of what is happening in the background. Why then should God afflict him? He, of course, does not know of the challenge of Satan, that is Job. Neither does he know that God is depending upon him in the crisis through which he is passing. And the songwriter asks uh, or says, may the Lord depend on you. Will he depend on you? All Job knows is that out of a clear sky, disaster has come upon him till he is left without family or property and uh, faith in God. This God knew he would do. This Satan said he will not do in the challenge of God. Uh, actually, Job was able to win. In this challenge that Satan uh, told God that, uh, you know, if I take everything from Job, he will curse you. Job was able to overcome. And so we are looking at this generation that uh, Job's account was recorded for a purpose. While we grant it historicity, we believe that it has also a wider meaning. God's people in the last days will pass through an experience similar to Job's. They will be tested as he was. They will have every earthly stay removed. Satan will be given permission to mend them. In addition to this, spirit of God will be withdrawn from the earth and the protection of earthly governments removed. God's people will be left alone to battle with the powers of darkness. They will be perplexed as was Job, but they, as did he, will hold fast their uh, integrity. Think about it. It's called Jacob's time of trouble, but he shall be saved from it. And what is this Jacob's time of trouble he had? Remember that um, Jacob is here. Somebody wants to rob him of his inheritance. That is the Angle Laban. So behind him, his Angle Laban is pursuing him. In front of him, his brother Esau is coming because also he had been robbed of his birthright. And then on the left, we had the Philistines. On the right, we have the, uh, the Hitter type. And so Job, uh, ja um, Jacob could not turn in any way, uh, any other way, but he wrestled with the Lord, confessing his sin and said to the Lord, I'll not leave you unless or until you bless me. And then God asks, Jacob, what is your name actually? And uh, 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 he tells him that he is Jacob and he just tells him from today, your name is changed. It shall be Israel, meaning that a conqueror. Now, God is expecting a last generation 
who shall be able to vanquish the powers of the evil one and be able to stand. And even though on behind they shall be pursued by the enemies and on the front the family members shall be against them and on the other side actually uh, the other denominations which are worshippers of the false uh, uh, doctrines and all that shall be against them these people shall wrestle with god and say that i'll not leave you unless you change my name and that is when you find that actually in revelation chapter 3 he says that he writes his new name on their forehead. Christ writes his new name on the forehead of these people. And in Revelation chapter 14, they have the father's name in their forehead. But let us look at the experience of uh, this last generation uh, uh, in the book of uh, uh, Great Controversy, page 608. Great Controversy, page 608. What... Um, we are told. Allow me to go to this and uh, we pray. GC 608. We are told, as the storm approaches a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy way, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them. And by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Brothers and sisters, will you be a part of those who have been not sanctified by the third angel's message, which separates the wheat from the tares? In this time of persecution, faith of the Lord's servants will be tried, just as Job's faith was tried and Jacob's faith was tried. They have faithfully given the warning looking to God and to his word alone. God's spirit moving upon their hearts has constrained them to speak. Stimulated with holy zeal and with the divine impulse strong upon them, they ended upon the performance of their duties without coldly calculating the consequences of speaking to the people the word which the Lord had given, has, had given to them. They have not consulted their temporal interests nor sought to preserve their reputation or their lives. Yet, look at this, when the storm of opposition and reproach bursts upon them, these are the last generation, the faithful one, under the banner of the third angel message, having the ensign of righteousness by faith, having the father's name in their forehead and having the new name of Christ uh, and seal in their forehead. Yet, when the storm of opposition and reproach burst upon them, some overwhelmed with consternation will be ready to exclaim, had we foreseen the consequences of our words, we would have held our peace. They are hedged in with difficulties. From behind, in front, on the sides, they have no other place to run. Yet this faithful, Satan assails them with fierce temptations. The work which they have undertaken seems far beyond their ability to accomplish. They are threatened with destruction. The enthusiasm which animated them is gone, yet they cannot turn back. Then feeling their utter helplessness, they flee to the mighty one for strength. They remember that the words which they have spoken were not theirs, but his who bade them give the warning. God put the truth into their hearts and they could not forbear but to proclaim it. Continued on about the people living in the most holy place, a contrast is given with the people who have lived in the other generation. The same trials have been experienced by men of God in ages past. Wycliffe, Haas, Luther, Tyndale, Baxter, Wesley urged that all doctrines be brought to the test of the Bible and declared that they will renounce everything which it condemned. Against these men, persecution raged with relentless fury, yet they ceased not to declare the truth. Different periods in the history of the church have each marked by the development of some special truth adapted to the necessities of God's people at that time. 
Every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who were blessed with this light were tempted and tried. The Lord gives a special truth for the people in an emergency who dare refuse to publish it. He commands his servant to present the last invitation of mercy to the world. And so this is a special group because it has to do a last work in the world. They cannot remain silent except at the peril of their souls. Christ ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. They must perform their duty and leave results with God. As the opposition rises to a fiercer height, the servants of God are again perplexed, for it seems to them that they have brought the crisis. But conscience or conscience and the word of God assure them that their cause is right, and though the trials continue, they are strengthened to bear them. The contest grows closer and sharper, but their faith and courage rise with the emergency. The testimony is we dare not tamper with God's word, dividing his holy law, calling one portion essential and another non-essential to gain the favor of the world. The Lord whom we serve is able to deliver us. Christ has conquered the powers of earth and shall be afraid of worldly already conquered. Persecution in its varied form is the development of a principle which will exist as long as Satan exists and Christianity has vital power. No man can serve God without enlisting against himself the opposition of the host of darkness. Evil angels will assail him, alarm that his influence is taking the prey for their hands. Evil men rebuked by his example will unite with them in seeking to separate him from God by alluring temptation. When this does not succeed, then a compelling power is employed to force the conscience. Lastly, we are told, but so long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. In still, it still controls to some extent the laws of the land. Were it not for these laws, the condition of the world would be much worse than it's now. While many of the rulers are active, agents of Satan, God also has his agents among the leading men of the nation. The enemy moves upon his servants to propose measures that will greatly impede the work of God, but statesmen who fear the Lord are influenced by holy angels to oppose such a propositions with unanswerable argument. Thus, a few men will hold in check the, a powerful current of evil. The opposition of the enemies of truth will be restrained that the third angel's message may do its work. When the final warning shall be given, it will arrest the attention of these leading men through whom the Lord is now working, and some of them will accept it and will stand with the people of God through the time of trouble. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the world, the whole earth with his glory. A work of world wide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. Then we read of the closing work, how it shall be glorious. The Advent movement in 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world. And in some countries, there was the greatest religious interest, which has been witnessed in any land since the reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel's message. We are told, the work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost as the former rain was given in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the unspring, the unspring of the precious seed. So the latter rain will be given and it is closed for the ripening of the harvest. Then shall we know if we follow to the, on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter rain and former rain unto the earth. Hosea 6, 3. Be glad then you shall children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. Joel 2.23. In the last day, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked it is opening. The prophecies which you are fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the apostle Peter looked forward when he said, 
Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. And so brothers and sisters, we close at this point. God is saying, repent ye and be converted. Will I hear his voice and will you hear his voice? As the tempest and the battle grows mere more fiercer and more uh, uh, um, perplexing. Will the Lord depend on you? And may the Lord be with you. And we know that everything that he has promised shall be accomplished by his word. The Lord is holding this earth by the power of his word. And he shall uphold us by the power of his word. And may the Lord bless us. Shall we close with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as even you have just uh, been able to hold up this uh, world with the power of your word, we know that um, that which you have promised shall be accomplished. And uh, faith is the key that openeth the doors that are closed. Let us allow us to have this uh, faith of the mustard seed that in thy grace we may be able to move the mountains that are before us that seems so hard to remove. And so thank you because you shall instill in us a faith that has never been before. Bless us to not just have this uh, knowledge, but to have the experimental religion that uh, you are seeking in your children. And may the name uh, of the Lord be praised forevermore for the things that he shall do unto us May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our Redeemer. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, brethren, may the Lord bless us. May you be encouraged and may the Lord depend on you. Blessings. <laughs>